This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, you have to excuse me. I'm used to talking a lot with my hands, uh, so I'll try to hold this close. But um, yeah, so I work, I'm uh, in the employee degree program, and so I also I moonlight as a um, squash breeder. And what's up? Oh, sorry. And I'm in charge of the breeding program along. I manage the breeding program along with Michael. And as most people know, we do all kinds of cucurbits. Uh, lately, the cucurbits all over, from all over the world, beans, peas, and peppers. But uh, today I'm here to tell you about uh, the novel resistance gene that we found in cucurbita moshata, um, resistance against powdery mildew, and uh, our search for markers in the genome. So, uh, yep, squash and pumpkins, cucurbita species. Um, this time of year, we all have them. Uh, in our bellies, we have our pumpkin pie. Uh, we have jack o' lanterns on our doorsteps, rotting away. Uh, three main species is cucurbita pipo, is your your smaller jack o' lanterns, and acorn squash, uh, yellow squash, um, spaghetti squash, many other scores. A cucurbita maxima, which has our kabocha squashes, the buttercup squash, and the giant pumpkins. Uh, you probably saw giant pumpkins in the news recently. Uh, they broke another world record for their size um, and the seeds are going for a thousand dollars a piece so I'll make sure to save your uh, giant pumpkin seeds um, and, and then finally <laughs> finally as long as they don't have pvp right so um, so and then finally we have the cucurbita moshata which is we're here to talk about today and we have our um, butternut type squash uh, tropical pumpkins calabaza and also um, so a processing pumpkin you know, Fields Pumpkin Dickinson, which is actually, if you buy pumpkin pie filling in a can, it primarily comes from this species. And it's a giant uh, watermelon shaped uh, pumpkin. Um, but so for powdery mildew resistance uh, between all the three species, the, there's currently a single source of powdery mildew resi uh, resistance that Henry Munger integrated from Cucurbita martinesii over, uh, in the 70s, and he brought it over into Cucurbita moshata. And that seems to be a dominant source of resistance on uh, chromosome 10. Um, our novel source of powdery mildew resistance uh, uh, does not have that uh, gene. So, uh, so we wanted to go about finding out why. As we know, single gene resistances are fragile. So we are uh, happy to soon be able to offer this uh, powdery mildew resistance in a commercially viable line. So we set out to identify the inheritance and segregation ratios for this novel powdery mildew resistance. Uh, we're genotype resistant and susceptible bulks from the F2 population from our, uh, we did actually a greenhouse screen and uh, generate, a, we're very quickly, uh, very soon gonna generate a marker set and identify candidate genes and uh, created some back cross populations this summer so that we can um, uh, verify uh, the markers and uh, hopefully in the next four to five years we hope to have some um, some commercial cultivars that we can offer with this uh, powdery mildew resistance and so uh, in order to do a screen for powdery mildew with the f2 population i um, collected powdery mildew spores from the field and i inoculated a flat of, of, of susceptible uh, susceptible plants and uh, I found this key for powdery mildew types uh, and it looked to me to be most likely uh, canadia formed in chains like a photosphera. Uh, this is a photo I took uh, using a microscope with a camera. I also looked at it with a better microscope and so it seems to me to be photosphera zanthii which is not a surprise. It's the most common uh, powdery mildew uh, in the world. Uh, Ercephi chicoraceum is the other a common powdery mildew that affects cucurbits, but I did not see it on there. Um, those other spikes are trichomes on the leaf. Uh, so here's the setup of our greenhouse screen. We typically had 10 plants in a 15 cell flat uh, with four inch pots. Um, either we had 10 plants of the F2, uh, 10 plants of one of the controls, parental controls, F1s, reverse F1s. And this is a lot, doesn't look like a lot, but this is a lot of plants. This is close to like 500 plants. Me and Michael spent uh, many days uh, evaluating all these plants. So it was 
during COVID, so we had to wear masks and it wasn't wasn't a whole lot of fun, but we got it done. And I think uh, the data will show we have some high quality data. And of course we had a bugle in the greenhouse so we could compare it to um, uh, the commercial current commercial source of powdery mildew resistance. Uh, that was produced by this lab. So here's some images of the plants to get an idea of what to expect in the F2. We looked at all of the controls and we evaluated them on the leaf surface, the underside of the leaf, the petioles and the stem. And what you could see here is Waltham, the susceptible control, has uh, mildew all over the leaf surface on the underside of the leaf, uh, the petioles, the stems. Uh, bugle, the novel, uh, the, sorry, bugle, the commercial source of powdery mildew resistance. Um, has mildew, a little bit of mildew on the on the leaf surface, but not really any mildew on the stems or petioles on the underside of the leaf. Um, so we look at our novel source of powdery mildew resistance. It's hard to find powdery mildew anywhere. There's a little bit of sporulation, but very low, and it does get a little bit into necrosis, but uh, it keeps growing and does very well. And if we look at both the F ones. Uh, between our novel powdery mildew resistance and Waltham, we see uh, mildew all over the stems, all over the leaves. Um, so it doesn't appear to be a very dominant uh, a tree. And then looking at it 20 days later, we see about the same thing uh, as I just described. Uh, both the F1s are about dying from powdery mildew, and as is Waltham. Bugle is, is surviving and doing okay, but it does have mildew on the leaf surface, and our but our novel powdery mildew resistance source uh, looks pretty clean and good. The leaves do senesce and get a little crosis, but whatever the action of this powdery mildew resistance is, it seems to prevent any sporulation. <clears throat> and and the difference between bugle and the novel powdery mildew resistance seems to be uh, uh, leaf surface sporulation. So. Then we look at the data from, from me and Michael looking at these hundreds of plants. Um, again, uh, uh, the stem has very little mildew on either of the resistance sources, um, but there's plenty of mildew uh, susceptible in both the F1s. Uh, the petioles about the same. Seems to be a little something going on there with the F1s. Get a little, maybe a little qualitative, quantitative resistance. But um, and the, again on leaf four. On the bottom, it's about the same. Uh, both the resistance sources are very low. Um, susceptible and F1s uh, have about 25% leaf coverage. But, and then it, we, again, when we look at the top of leaf four for this resistance source, um, it, it is where it stands out from bugle to the novel, novel uh, our novel powdery mildew resistance source stands out against bugle with the PMO gene. And so uh, that's where we see the difference. So when, uh, we wanted to think about the F2 population and what we should use to score uh, as resistant, susceptible. Uh, this is a, a, a graph of the F2 scores of the whole F2 population and the leaf scores. And so we decided to draw this red line in the sand about where the, um, at the upper bounds of the standard deviation for uh, the novel resistance source kind of saying this is about where we see a lot of change. And when we ran our chi-square test for a three to one uh, ratio, I got a p-value of 0.427, which looks very probable that this has at least a single major gene controlling the resistance. Uh, and it looks like a recessive resistance. Perhaps there's some quantitative aspects and some modifiers, but it looks pretty strongly to be uh, a recessive resistance or a dominant susceptibility. Um, so you say, Greg, that was a great greenhouse screen, but what about in the field? Well, this is what I saw in September this year throughout all the controls. Uh, Waltham and the two F1s had very little leaves left after the powdery mildew. Um, and uh, Bugle had, you know, quite a bit of leaves, more than Waltham or the two F1s between our novel powdery mildew resistance. But our novel powdery mildew resistance has its full foliage, and yes, it does produce fruit. And they don't taste too bad, uh, but they're not a type of uh, uh, squash that many people would recognize in this country. So we're looking forward to uh, integress it into some more common types. Uh, so for genotyping, going back to the greenhouse screen, we extracted DNA from the 22 resistant 
and 22 susceptible F2 plants um, and the parents. We did uh, next seek 500, 550 sequencing. Um, we got about 40X coverage on the parents and 4X coverage on the individuals in the bulks. And um, so uh, then I ran uh, the reads through a, a, a QTL seek bioconda package and it outputted a VCF file, which was then further annotated by SNPF package. And, um, uh, and then it takes the VCF, annotated VCF file, which also has a, a, a Delta, Delta SNP index on there. So we got a, a, a significant hit on chromosome 13. Uh, it got over the 99% uh, confidence interval. There's a couple other places where it got close to the 95% confidence interval, but uh, it definitely looks like uh, it never breached the 95%. So uh, looking at chromosome 13, I divided up the region into about 100,000 base pair chunks, try and find map the region. And I sent away for some primers to, uh, for uh, developing markers. And hopefully the uh, primer should be in our mailbox right now. And so we're gonna take remnant DNA uh, from the resistant individuals and hopefully this week run some PCR on those to try to uh, find out which markers are most closely uh, correlated with uh, this resistance trait. And then fairly uh, this summer, we'll test the markers on the back cross population that I developed this summer. And uh, soon we'll also verify in a different population. And hopefully in three, uh, four to five years, we should be able to have a, a resistant cultivar to release to the um, growers and, and seed companies. So uh, we're excited to be able to offer um, growers another source of powdery mildew resistance in cucurbit and moshata that will help reduce fungicide use and hopefully uh, uh, slow the development of powdery or uh, fungicide resistant powdery mildew strains. Thank you very much for your attention and Thank you to my committee, Michael and Anurag Agarwal and Jack Fabrizio for helping me with the, um, with the genetics, genomics, and uh, everybody in lab, Mads Lab helped plant the seeds. Courtney, I think, did the <laughs> seeds for the uh, greenhouse screen and our harvest fruits and all that. So uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Do you have any plans to stack two genes? Do you have any benefits from a stack? Oh uh, yeah, we that's something we want to try very soon, and so we'll see what happens. And hopefully, as I said, yeah, the bugle gene is on uh, that came from cucurbit and martinezia is on chromosome ten. So hopefully, they have a benefit. There is there tends to be a little bit of a trade off with the powdery mildew resistance gene, so we'll have to. Uh, in, in years when there's a lot of powdery mildew. Um, it, they tend to do better than the susceptible cultivars. So we'll see if there's a, a benefit to having it stacked or not. Um, great presentation. Um, I was just wondering if you know anything about if there's any races for powdery mildew and like, is there a potential for like major gene resistance for powdery mildew to overcome it? Yeah, there definitely is. And that's why, uh, I think there are, there are many races. I think I have a, I have to look at it again. Henry Munger and, <laughs> and Molly John did a lot of work on that. I haven't reviewed the literature in a while, but I'll have to take a look into that. But um, yeah, it's definitely potential. Yes. Uh, I saw that you tried or you evaluated both the reciprocal crosses between the susceptible and the, the other one, like using the reciprocal crosses. Yeah, so so that's what we had there when I had the two F ones. Yeah, I had I, my question is if there is any effect reporter that you found that is depending on the which parent is used as a female or or as a part. As a male it didn't seem like there was much of an effect either way. I think uh, if I look at my data, it looked like the scores are a little flip flopped on one or the other. Like sometimes one did a little bit better on other parts of the like the patio or the stem, but there wasn't much uh, difference on the leaf. I think either time they didn't have a statistical difference between either of the F1s or any of the locations. Yes. Yeah, but uh, the copper salt, they treat them and can be uh, 
I mean, decrease the symptom of uh, the infection, right? Sorry, can you repeat? What? Yeah, I, mean, I missed the beginning part. Right, I mean, the copper sulfate. Oh, the copper sulfate, yeah. yeah. My question is, uh, is there any differences of the uh, tolerant line and susceptible line to the treaty? Uh, the copper sulfate? Uh, we're not sure, but that would be something, definitely an interesting question to explore. Okay. Thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.